Hey everyone, welcome to the last Black Belt session. Um, although actually the most popular sessions in each track are going to be repeated tomorrow morning, so vote in the app for your, for your favorites and then, uh, and then those ones can get repeated tomorrow morning. Uh, so we've got a talk about ContainerD and BuildKit now. And it's my pleasure to introduce two of our Docker engineers, Michael Crosby and Tonis Teague, uh, to talk about that. Great. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming. So this will be a two-part talk. I'll start out talking about ContainerD. We'll kind of go in depth on the client aspect of it. And then Tonis will take over and talk about BuildKit. So if you're not familiar with ContainerD, it's basically a container runtime for platform builders. It's not geared towards end users like, like Docker is. It's geared towards providing a service to Docker developers, like the people building Docker or the people building Kubernetes and other container platforms. So with that in mind, ContainerD is scoped to the local node. It doesn't it runs only over a Unix socket, and it has a gRPC, gRPC API uh, over that socket to talk with it. And um, some, some of the recent changes from our ContainerD 1.0 release was in 1.1, we added native cube support with a CRI endpoint. So in this talk, we'll be doing a deep dive into the ContainerD client and what it's like developing on ContainerD when you're building a platform. And basically, ContainerD has a smart client. So like, what is a smart client? It's basically responsibilities are split between the client and the server. The server doesn't do everything, and the client doesn't do everything. So in the container world, you're probably familiar with ver various Docker feature sets like uh, image fetching and image storing. So in the Docker world, you have a Docker pool. But in the ContainerD world, the pool of the content from a registry happens all client side so that you can have different authentication mechanisms for how you authenticate with the registry, how content is fetched whether it's fetched from cache or uh, directly from the registry. And then storage happens on the ContainerD server side where it's deduplicated and content addressed. And the same thing happens with IO. The client is responsible for creating IO for the container and redirecting it to where you want. So you have uh, the situation where in Docker we have logging drivers. But if you're building a logging driver, you need to drop back a level. And the ContainerD client allows Docker to get the actual standard I.O. of the container and redirect it to external loggers, to log files, or chunk the log messages from the pipes into like new line messages for the log drivers and various things like that. And then finally, snapshot creation versus snapshot unpacking. Um, if you're not familiar with the snapshot, uh, snapshot drivers, it's basically V2 of graph drivers within Docker. So you have overlay and device mapper, things like that. And in ContainerD, we have snapshotters. And the creation of snapshotters happens in the daemon, but unpacking content from an image or from a copy operation, adding files into it during build happens client side. So why did we build a smart client? And that was basically we wanted a single daemon interface. And it's not saying one daemon to rule them all because we think it's the best, but we wanted all the various platforms to be able to depend on a single daemon without modification. And the smart client allows people to innovate at the higher layers. You can decide how you want to handle networking, but the ContainerD daemon facilitates the life cycle and uh, execution of a task or a container. And it also helps keep the container D stable and boring, where you're not having a lot of the um, 
high level features of a platform like orchestration and and even things like logging drivers in the container d daemon it just provides simple primitives like here's standard in out air of the container you do what you want with it and we have a very simple contract at that end so kind of what you get with the container d smart client is you get multi-tenancy via container d namespaces so since our clients are various uh, container platforms, we needed to have a single daemon that can uh, service both Docker, Cube, and other people at the same time and not have any conflicts with container IDs. Every client should be able to have a container name test and not conflict with, with each other. And that's kind of what you get with namespaces. And you can see kind of in this code snippet, um, container D uses context within Golang and you can set a namespace on a context whenever you interact with the client so almost every API within container D is namespaced from snapshotters to containers to tasks to images and when you interact with the client you set, set a context for each of these calls and that will uh, redirect to what namespace you're working in so the next part is you get direct I.O. access, and I talked a little bit about this, but in a lot of systems, they either buffer logs or they delimit logs by new line. With Containerd, you get the actual uh, pipes for the container standard I.O. So when you're building out your platform and you want to do crazy things like this, such as uh, take our Go main processes standard in, use that as the standard in for the container, put standard out in a buffer in memory, and then log standard air to our log file. There's nothing that prevents you in container D from doing this and other crazy things like that. And really it helps with uh, implementations for, for Docker and various log drivers. And then finally, uh, you kind of get containers as types. And this is one thing that I, I've always wanted from the very beginning, working with Docker and other things. Building container runtimes and working with containers is hard. And containers are just various syscalls and Linux features that you have to duct tape together to make a container. And after a while, that can get old. And so with the Containerd client, we have all these Go types and structs with methods where you can iterate over containers, you can use ifs, fors, uh, do different polymorphic operations. Just uh, If you want to kill a task, you just call task.kill, and it just works. So it's more abstract where when you're building out new features in Docker or other platforms, you don't have to worry about the lower level syscalls. You can iterate faster and just create this container, attach it to a network, and do things like that. So kind of my demo will be a pipeline demo, and uh, it'll showcase kind of a basic implementation for the Containerd client. And what we're going to do is uh, use this YouTube download image, which basically downloads various videos off of YouTube, and then we'll create a pipeline to FFmpeg to extract the MP3 audio. And the interesting thing about this is you could always pipeline containers together today, but they all had IO copy in like user space, or you were uh, accepting a log stream over an API, it was over HTTP or over a Unix socket, then you're piping it in through another API. And with this, when we have raw access to the container pipes, we can do a zero copy pipeline between containers. So I, I just grabbed a video from our Docker account so I wouldn't get in trouble to do this demo. And hopefully we can see this pretty well. But this is kind of a basic implementation of the Containerd client. We create a new client with the address. We create a new namespace. And for this one, I have a namespace called DockerCon, so it's not going to conflict with anything else running on my system. We have client.pool 
to fetch down our YouTube DL image and that gives us an image type and then we can start creating our containers and kind of containers as types we create a container called YouTube and this one we're enabling host networking and adding some host resolve conf and the host files to to handle that and then the different process args and then secondly we have our uh, other FFmpeg container which doesn't have any networking in this pipeline it doesn't need it so uh, we omit that and the basic args is this pipe dot mp4 is the dot makes FFmpeg accepted over standard in which is very cryptic but it took the hardest part of this demo was figuring out all the FFmpeg options and then finally, I have this pipeline uh, type that I created. And we can see, see the implementation of this here. And container D uses FIFOs as the default for these. And so we're creating two FIFO sets, the left side and the right side. And all we're doing to kind of stitch these two containers together is we're saying, the right side standard in is the left side standard out. And then uh, that's, that's basically it. So if I get back to where we were. So we created our new pipeline and then we create tasks from the YouTube container and the FFmpeg container and we assign YouTube to the left side of the pipeline and then FFmpeg to the right side of the pipeline. And then the only IO copy in this is just taking FF's MPEG's output of the MP3 file to this program standard out so that we can play the MP3 audio in this demo. So if we go here and we run this, um, it's just a go binary with the client. It, I have it redirected to out.mp3 file. It will start the YouTube download. It piped it to it without any like IO, any user land IO between the two containers. And then if I SCP that MP3 file to my desktop and go over here, we should be able to play this. Uh, yeah. This event is uh, kind of a benchmark in terms of uh, restarted. All right, hold on. Okay, so if you want to get involved in Container D, uh, or it's Container D slash Container D under GitHub, and we're always looking for people to. Uh, contribute other awesome ideas and work on the project. So now I'll turn it over to Tonus to talk about BuildKit. Yeah, thanks, Michael. So, as Michael said, I'm going to shift topics a little bit, uh, talk to you about another important component we have in uh, Docker platform, and that's the builder. Uh, so, very similarly as with uh, ContainerD, we've also created an, a new uh, open source project for the builder, uh, and also very similar to ContainerD, this project is more designed to the power users and people who want to build stuff on top of that. So it leaves lots of rooms for, for uh, and flexibility to have to add your more opinionated logic on top of it. So, first news we have is that uh, we are bu bringing BuildKit into Docker Daemon. So previously, if you wanted to use BuildKit, you would have uh, needed to uh, use it as a separate utility. Now. In 1806, uh, 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 once uh, Docker C1806 comes out, you will be able to use it straight in your Docker build command. Uh, it's an experimental at the moment. You need to opt in 
and I will show exactly how it looks like in uh, later. So as I said, we now have uh, support for BuildKit in Docker C. We also have some other community projects that are using BuildKit. We have an IMG project that's, uh, that provides uh, a standalone, unprivileged uh, builder, uh, runs rootless containers by default, and also is powered by BuildKit. Uh, OpenFast Cloud is, uh, is doing some uh, uh, collaboration between serverless uh, and uh, building images as part of your functions. And then there is a container, uh, container build, uh, builder interface. That's a project that's, um, that, uh, where you can use your uh, Kubernetes YAML to, do, to define your build jobs. And it also supports BuildKit. So there are lots of new stuff in BuildKit. I am um, um, not going to cover all of those, just don't have enough time. But uh, make sure if you're interested in these things, uh, uh, follow up later, look at the repository, things like that. And the three main categories, I would say, where these features land are a quality so that we have fixed some, some really basic, uh, or we have made some really basic design changes that really have, have bothered us in the, in the previous implementation. So these are, for example, like getting rid of side effects, uh, storage model, cache model, these are completely new. Then we have lots of performance updates, because uh, nobody wants to watch their code compile. And, uh, and then I think most importantly, we have uh, designed this thing so that uh, we could uh, add, continuously add new features on top of it. We have uh, looked at some of the maintenance problems we have had before with Docker files, for example, that I will show. So first thing, let's give you an idea what, uh, what those performance updates would mean. So major disclaimer in here, uh, like, Performance uh, differs in every project you try. It. So, so this is all these numbers are based on the Movie Movie project where we built the Docker engine, and the Docker file it uses uh, machine is digital ocean. Is, if anyone cares, so the time it took to to rebuild Movie Movie directly from empty state. So current version happened to be for some reason exactly two uh, two times uh, slower. So, uh, so almost six minutes compared to the three minutes in build kit. So that's quite a big save for you. Uh, another uh, case, like if you are built it once, then you probably are repeating your build. What happens when you get the cache match? So in this case, current, uh, current version took 3.6 seconds to figure out that Everything was already cached. It is a complex Docker file. Uh, and BuildKit figured it out in, uh, in half a second. It's another uh, point where you actually had a code change, so you had a partial cache, cache match. So again, like 2.5, still good. And to finish up those numbers, there is this, uh, there are some new features in BuildKit, of course. One of those uh, new features is, uh, remote uh, build cache option. So you can build once and you can, uh, you can push your uh, build cache to a registry and then you can, on a, on a new machine, you can refer back to this cache and, and it can detect the cache match uh, without even downloading all the layers. It can do it efficiently. If it finds a cache, cache match, then it will only download the specific layer. And of course, like in, these cases we are getting into really big differences because the current uh, demon doesn't support that. So five minutes spared there. Uh, so maybe this got you a little bit interested in what this build kit thing is. So let's see how you could use it. Uh, it's very versatile. You can use it as a 
as a library like Mobi uh, or, or IMG do, it also comes with its own standalone daemon and, and client. You can use it with ContainerD. Um, if you use it with, uh, with its own daemon, with its own uh, client, you get some new features like you get a brand new gRPC API for, for your starting your builds. We have a Go client library that you can use to, to define your builds in, a, in, in Go and then send it as build requests. Uh, we now have support for uh, rootless execution, so you can actually start your, uh, your uh, build kit daemon with your regular user, never requires root. Uh, then it's also very important to have some visibility inside your build because like your builds uh, will become more complex. We encourage that, so you need to uh, understand what exactly happens there. And in, with, uh, with the open tracing uh, providers we have in, in BuildKit, you can see things like how, how the clients and daemon share data, what processes actually get executed. You can see how the concurrency of uh, BuildKit takes effect, things like that. And sort of a work in progress at the moment, but we are working on the multi-worker model. So there's some of the code in here. It's not fully distributed yet, but this is definitely what we are looking at. Uh, let's see what's inside. Uh, so BuildKit is based on a completely new design. It's not based on the old code base. Uh, in the center of BuildKit, there's a new build format, and we call that build format LLB. It's, you can find some resemblance in the LLVM uh, intermediate representation. Uh, so this LLB thing is, uh, is a quantum addressable DAG. It's a real dependency graph, uh, and it's binary, so it's machine generated. It's made for machines. It's very low level. You're not supposed to write it, but it's very, very good for us to execute and cache. So when we receive this LLB, uh, it only defines the execution path, and we will find the most optimal one. We will remove all the nodes that are not needed for your final build result. Uh, and as we execute it, we make sure that everything is cached for the next users, and also that the previous cache is properly, properly uh, loaded. And one thing to note is that uh, LB is built to scale, so we have tried this with graphs that have thousands of edges, and it doesn't have any issues with that. So in that regard, it's much more similar to to some generic builders like uh, Make Ninja or, or something more modern like Bazelor. And for example, this is an example where I it's like 10% of a dependency graph that I generated from a Go package directly to LLB, so very different from Docker files but it handles it very well. So if you want to write LLB, then we, as I said before, we have this uh, client library. Uh, you can use that. But a more practical way to, to generate LLB is to use something called the front end. So what a front end is, the, is that it is a component that runs as part of your build that can take any definition you like and generate it to LLB so that the actual build kit can execute it. And the best parts, uh, part about frontends is that they are distributable as container images. So if you, if you want to change the frontend, if you want to add a frontend, uh, you don't need to merge it into a binary. You don't need to wait for everyone to update their, uh, their Docker daemons or anything like that. And of course, we want to build Docker files, so uh, we have uh, implemented a Docker file front end. But uh, anyone can create a front end in here. Uh, it's not limited at all, and uh, it doesn't need to be anything like Docker file. So LLB is not similar to Docker file at all. It's just the execution and, and uh, just for execution and caching. So what do you get with the Dockerfile front end? Uh, first of all, as every front end, 
it automatically picks up all the concurrency and cache features that you that every front end gets from the LLB layer. Then uh, it is fully compatible with current Docker, so all your to current Docker files should work. If if it doesn't, then let us know. We'll fix it. Uh, we uh, so there are some some new features that uh, that you will notice when you try it out. You will notice that your stage your build stages start to build in parallel. If you are using uh, multi-stage, you will notice that if you are targeting a specific stage, your some of your stages may be skipped because we can detect that that uh, there was no no need to actually run those commands. Um, then we have supports for for doing the similar skipping in the build context, so we can detect what kind of files you actually use in your add and copy uh, commands and. Basically, if you don't use some, some files, then we don't put it in the build context. And when you do the repeated build, we have another level of optimization where we just sync up the changes. Um, and so th these changes were all like kind of invisible. You will just notice that things are m much more smooth now. Uh, we do have one syntax change as well, and that is a syntax directive. So. The reason why we added this syntax directive is that it is very uh, hard to uh, make language changes in Dockerfile at the moment. Uh, every time we make a change, those changes are forever. We can never revert them. And so we have to be super careful to, if we're going to let anything in. So that's from the maintainer side. From the user side, it's not good as well because if you uh, if you want to start using some experimental feature, you need to upgrade. And it's not so easy for in case of Dockerfile features because like the, every daemon that you ever use needs to be updated. Like for example, maybe your CI was not updated, so so you can't start using this uh, this uh, feature. And it's very hard to predict like what what version of daemon will I use for this Dockerfile. So. To solve this problem, we think it would be good to use this uh, loadable frontends feature that BuildKit supports. And if you want to add uh, more experimental features, we can just load them in from the images. And the way to do that is that we have this directives uh, feature in Docker files currently that basically allows you to add some configuration on top of your Docker file. And we're adding a new one, uh, calling it Syntax. And you can just set it to, to an image, uh, like an image reference that, that someone has pushed. And if a Dockerfile uh, frontend will build your Dockerfile, it will, if it will see this syntax directive, it will just stop working and redirect its job to this other frontend. So that makes sure that every frontend builds, uh, builds correctly with the, with the version that it was intended to. So the author of the Docker file chooses the implementation. It's not like chosen randomly based on what, what version of uh, uh, daemon is being used. So we have a bunch of those uh, uh, new Docker file features that, that have proposals that have community acceptance. And they're, a lot of them have been like stalling a bit. So as a showcase, I picked one of those that are, is quite heavily requested. It's probably the, the, the top one. And that's the run dashes mount proposal. And what this proposal allows you to do is that in your Docker file, you could have direct access to the files from your build context, from other stages, uh, from images, for example. And also, it allows you to create something called a cache mount that uh, that you can use as a cache location between your builder invocation. So what this allows you to do is to add another level of caching in your build that's like application-specific caching, because there are lots of applications uh, that, uh, that support some built-in caching mechanism, like lots of programming languages. Uh, Go has one, or many, many package managers, uh, like NPM as a cache folder, APT. 
bundler or everything like this. Maven, of course, like, uh, can use it for the MQ folder. And so we have implemented this as an as a example of the syntax directive, and I will, I will show it uh, in a demo. So let's go with, let's see the demo. Sorry, that was too early. And I don't want to upgrade now. <laughs> so I'm he here in, uh, in, uh, in an empty, empty machine. I have no state in here. And let's see, I'm in Mobi code base in here. And it, it, of course, has a Docker file. It has a huge Docker file. So let's build something. Let's not build the whole thing yet because, because it will take a lot of time. Uh, let's build one stage. I, I know that this Docker file has a, has a CLI stage, so let's see what happens. So, and as you can see, it takes time, and then it uh, loads some kind of build context, then it starts installing some kind of packages. Let's cancel that. So, why, do, why does it need to install Creo to, to get the uh, CLI stage? Uh, well, that's because it doesn't use BuildKit yet. So, if you, if you get, if you upgrade to 1806 or the Nike build currently, what you need to do is to opt in. You opt in by setting this environment variable, uh, docker build kit equals one. And now if I run the same command again, we'll see a much nicer output with timings. Uh, you will also see that it already finished. Uh, So, as you can see, there was no, no attempt to install cryo in here because, of course, it could detect that these stages were not needed. Uh, some other things to notice is that there was a build context uh, transfer also happening in here in parallel. And build context in here was 1.5K, while in this previous build it was 40 megs. So, that was because uh, it saw that uh, like 99% of those files were not required by this stage, so they were never transferred at all. So, and if I rebuild it, if I get back my internet connection, come on, don't do this to me. Ah, ah. One second. Okay, are we back? Yeah. So if I do this again, it's instantaneous. So uh, as you might expect, everything is everything is cached now, and we can see that the context was even smaller now because we only need to transfer the changes. So uh, there were no changes. This is just some metadata that we that we need to figure out that there was no changes. And just to give you a quick example of the. No, no, no. Let's see if my other terminals work. I really should have set up my wired internet connection in here. One second, sorry. Yeah, I should have set up some local demos. Uh, are we back? Can go back to the slice sense. Thus, so back online. Uh, 
what I'm showing in here at the moment is just that I, I ran the full rebuild. You can see the caching uh, or the parallelization in action. Uh, lots of stages building, building in parallel. Uh, so this is the main reason why you got this uh, 2x speed improvement and things like that in the, in the previous performance graphs. And now I will try to, let's cancel this one, and I will try to show you the, the, uh, the run dashes mountain action as well. So in here, I have a Docker file, that's the old style Docker file. Uh, you can, what it does is just something, copying something and, and making a tarball out of it. So it's copying some files, making tarball, and the only reason it's copying those files is to make a tarball out of it. So it's not really efficient at all. In this other file, I have the same thing, but it's, but we're now using the run dashes mount syntax. And basically this allows you to do the same thing. You can just directly, uh, directly mount the assets folder from your build context so that it's available to your run command. And if I run this one, docker build ft1, you can see that it doesn't recognize what this uh, mount flag is. Well, that was because the current version doesn't support that, but as soon as I add this syntax directive in, in front of it, it will stop using the docker file front end and it will actually use this image that I pushed earlier with, and when I built this image, it did have support for run mount. So I do the same thing again, and now you will see that it actually pulled down this Docker file run mount image, and it used this image to actually build this Docker file. Everything succeeded. I have this running uh, uh, exactly like, uh, like I wanted to in one line. And to just show you this one more in action is that I've used the same logic with the cache mounts with, uh, with, uh, with a real project in BuildKit. Let's see if I can quickly open this one. So this is the real Docker file uh, that I use in BuildKit and that and that really is supposed to demonstrate the main, main uh, problem we have currently that you will see all the time. You change the code and you want to rebuild it and you want your, your code to be rebuilt really fast. And in this case, I will use the run dash uh, mount with a special type cache option to rebuild all my Go binaries. And I've set the location to the Go cache folder. So if I build this now, well, first of all, if I, just built this. Sorry. Docker build dash f and dot. You will see that this demo is going really fine. <laughs> that everything was of course cached because I because I ran it before. So and in this other terminal. I have the same thing, but I don't have run dash mount used. And you can see that this one is cached as well as soon as I enable build kit. And, but now let's see if, what happens when I do an update in here and the same thing in here. So I just made a code change, uh, not this one. And so the first one, top one is using cache, cache uh, mount, so it's leveraging go caching. The other one is the regular one. The best thing that we can do just with parallelization, cache uh, stage skipping and things like that. So let's start the bottom one, one first, missing dot in here. And wrong path as well. And let's start the other one as well. 
So they're looking very similar at the moment, but you can see that the first one finished. So that's because uh, it leveraged the co-caching. And you can do this over and over again. I can make another modification. I can rebuild it. And it still finishes before the other one has a chance to, chance to finish up. So these are the numbers for this uh, specific example. So the first one is from, well, the first one is too ridiculous. But the, but the second one is the one where I actually manually removed all the commands that BuildKit would have removed automatically. So third one is uh, regular BuildKit. So the difference between third and second one is the parallelization and, uh, and uh, optimized context. But if you do the application-specific caching, then you're in a whole different category. You're uh, basically in another 10x faster. And this is really something that could change your, could completely change your developer for the workflow. So that's all for me. I encourage everyone to check out the 1806 or the nightly builds at the moment. Uh, uh, enable build kit, uh, give us feedback so we can bring it out of experimental. Thank you.